Welcome, it's Paul Adams at the First Southern Baptist Church in Reading, Ohio. It's June 27th. For me, it's a Saturday evening, and I count it a great joy to be with you and to share God's Word. And I'd like to begin reading from the book of Proverbs, and it's from the fourth chapter, verse 18. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. Let me read that again. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. Scripture tells us that there is a path, and it's a path that God has put together for you and I to follow. We're reminded that when Jesus came to earth, he demonstrated for us the path that God the Father had given him. And he followed it perfectly. Even to the cross, he followed a path. It was a path of obedience, and yet it was also a path of joy. What he was doing was pleasing God the Father in heaven, and yet he was giving his life as a sacrifice for even you and I today. He was dying for me. He was dying for you. Such love was displayed on the cross. There's a song that's called the Via Dolorosa, which means the way of suffering. He was walking a path of suffering so that through his suffering, the path that God the Father had given him, it would be through that suffering that you and I would have a way that would be made known to us, a way to know God as our Father. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Again, I want to repeat what John chapter 14, verse 6 says. Jesus was speaking, and He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but through me. He described himself as a way. He is the way to know God. There is no other way. The Bible says this, There is none other, none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other way. Jesus is the way that God made known to us. A way that Jesus perfectly followed, even to the cross. Jesus never went to the right nor to the left, the Bible says. Which means He never changed His opinion. He never drifted off course. He was focused. And He never left the Father's will. Even before He went to the cross, Jesus prayed, Not my will be done, your will be done. He was concerned that he was going to die on the cross and he wanted to do it perfectly because he knew he had come to finish God the Father's work, the work of salvation, the work of bringing us, those who have sinned, which is all of us. He was going to make a way so that every person could come to know God as their Father. Do you know God as your Father? You can. That's the way Jesus made it possible when He died and was resurrected. Jesus made a way. And that way was a path of suffering. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, open up your heart and life. Receive Him today. Receive Jesus. Because God has a path. A path that He wants us as His righteous people. Not righteous because of the works which we have done, but by the mercy of God, He saved us. He rescued us from sin. And now He has transferred us. He has moved us. He has set us apart for His own good use. That is called sanctification. He sanctified us. He consecrated us. Which means He took us from the slave market of sin. He freed us through Jesus' death and resurrection. And now He has placed us in the kingdom of His dear Son. And now as citizens of the kingdom of God, I have now been given a path. A path in life. This is the path of the righteous. 
It is a path that God wants me to follow. It's not an easy path, as some would call um, following God. Some say, you know, that uh, if you follow God, He's going to take you to heaven. And that's true. But to think that following Jesus is an easy path would be co contradicting the Scripture. You see, when we follow Jesus, we live by faith and not by sight. The just shall live by their faith in God. Which means that what I'm looking at in the world necessarily is not what God wants me to be focused on. For example, taking a job. Well, we all want a job that's going to give us the best pay, the best benefits, the best retirement. And so these are the things that our eyes see, the things of the world. But the things of God are not necessarily in agreement with the things of the world. To be true, oftentimes they're opposed. God wants us to depend upon Him. He wants us to trust in Him. The Scripture says, My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory through Christ Jesus. That is a promise that God makes to me. That's not a promise the world can give. The, again, the Scripture says, My God shall supply all of my needs. He knows what I need. Not my wants. Because sometimes we know our wants and our needs are far different. God knows what I need in life. And sometimes He knows that if I had a, a million dollars uh, or whatever the amount of money might be, I think and know in my heart that God necessarily does not give all of those things of the world because He knows it would ruin a lot of us. It would ruin me. He wants me to go through life day by day depending upon Him, trusting in His Word, following and seeking God's path for my life. We need to be careful because sometimes if I listen to others or if I'm always concerned about pleasing myself, I'll make the wrong decision. Because there's many different ways or many different directions in life that I can go. Many different opportunities in life that I could reach out. And we need to be cautious as we talk to our young folk our young children. We need to be careful because I know how it's been. I've had three children and oftentimes we want to coax them. You need to find a job that's going to give you the good pay and the good benefits. And we try to influence our kids to, to seek out certain careers. And giving our children advice is certainly something I think God wants us to do. But the better advice is this. God loves you. God is all powerful. God is all wisdom. He's all everything that you need. And so it's better to seek God's will and purpose for your life and then follow His path for your life, wherever that goes. That is the better advice. It's not about trying to please yourself and trying at a young age to try to teach our young people uh, to believe in God on Sundays. And then when we leave here, we act as though God doesn't exist. I started working at uh, P&G, Procter & Gamble, in 1990. And I remember going to the lab. I worked in organic chemistry out of the University of Miami. And I remember uh, sitting down at the desk. I was replacing a certain person. And I looked at his lab notebook. And if you, in a, in a work environment, in an organic chemistry lab or any kind of lab, taking one's notes and recording what they've done in an experiment, what the conclusions were. That's part of daily life. And you eventually develop a method. And, and a person I worked for taught me so much. Oftentimes I thought he was cruel and very demanding. But I realized if it was not for that person being placed in my life by God's hand, I would never have learned and never had developed as a chemist and I hate to even think that myself and I'm that developed but everything that I learned was so important from that particular doctor in organic chemistry isn't that true with God's past sometimes we question God where are you I said in my heart I want to follow you and now I'm going through these difficulties I'm going through these problems where someone is for example not being very nice to me at least in my eyes but I realize as I follow God he knows my needs not my wants and sometimes he's trying to get me to an end goal to make me a mature person in Christ 
to develop character and integrity. And sometimes that means I've got to go through difficult situations where I'm learning to lean more upon God, learning to stand and to mature in Christ. And so I look back on those events even then, 30 years ago, and realize, Lord, thank you. I, I sometimes was guilty of blaming you, Lord, where are you? Because I was miserable there for a couple years. But I look back on that. I think, you know, God, you were there all the time. You knew what I needed. And that's what I needed at that point in time. Well, uh, let me move on. I, I sat down at the desk and I had a lab notebook, like I said. And I could see the person who worked there before me. And this person was so efficient. They did so many experiments and their lab notebook was filled with detail. I could see that this person was very intelligent, very industrious, such a hardworking person. His name, I never met the individual. And so I should be careful using people's names without getting permission. But his name was Mark Wanamaker. I always remember that name. Never met him. And eventually after I worked there a year or so, and I heard so many great reports about how this particular person that I replaced or attempted to replace, they were perhaps the best at what they did. They were one of the best lab chemists. And they were so very good at what they were doing. And finally, I talked to my boss and he brought up the subject. The person who was there before you, he came into the office. I hope I'm telling this correctly. I know I have the general story correct. And my boss told me, who is the section head of research, he said that Mark Wanamaker came in and told me that God had a different path for his life. He wanted him, calling him to be a missionary. And he left, he came in and said he was leaving this job, though evidently he was very successful at what he was doing. And he set out on a different course, a course of faith in God. Not living by sight, but living by faith. And he went off and became a missionary, a foreign missionary. I never met him, but you can still see 30 years ago, I remember very clearly his name. I remember reading his notes in his notebook. And I would think to myself, if only someday I could be so efficient and gain the respect of my peers as being such a hardworking, smart individual. Well, I don't know if I ever got that point. I don't think I did. But more impressive to me as a Christian, a follower of Jesus, was that here was an individual who decided that it was more important to follow God's way and to leave behind the things that he was doing in the world. Not necessarily what he was doing was evil. Don't take this message wrong. It wasn't necessarily what he was doing was evil. He had a wife and a family, I was told. But what he knew in his heart evidently far outweighed anything in his life. And he knew that if God was leading him in that direction, then God would provide all that he needed. God would take care of his children, his wife, and God was going to make great things happen in his life. He would probably go through difficult days. I heard, I believe, someone told me he went off to Thailand. So I don't know where he went or where he's at today. But I, I was left with this great message about what it means to truly follow Christ. There is a way. Jesus showed us there is a way. And the way is always uh, a way of faith, of trusting in God. Even when Jesus was here on earth, He showed us the importance of praying all the time, staying in communication with God, always trusting in God the Father's will and purpose. And then... He would get up and he would set out to accomplish God's work in his life. He would, he would follow God's way. And by doing that, he made a way so that you and I could come to know God as our Father. There is a way. Let's take it to the next step. There's a way for each person to maybe correct bad mistakes in their life. There's a way. The scripture tells me of this. I'm in the book of Proverbs. I had several passages. I don't have enough time to read them all. But I'd like to read from Proverbs, the 12th chapter, verse 28. In the way of righteousness, there is life. Along that path is immortality. In the way of righteousness, there is life. 
And then in Proverbs, the third chapter, the verse, verse 5 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight or He will direct your steps. He will make His path known to you. If I will acknowledge Him, which means I'm going to bring God into every situation of my life. You say, how can I really know God's way? Well, first of all, God's way will always be in alignment with His Word. His Word is His instruction book for living. And so God will never contradict His Word. It is alive and powerful. And so I will spend time in God's Word, reading, studying, praying, and allow God's Word to mature and grow within me. God's Word is often personified as um, a person. And that is Jesus. Uh, he is the living Word. And He has been planted in my heart. And now He is growing within me. And the only way that I could truly know God's way in my life is by allowing the life of Christ, His Word, to grow in me so that He will mature in me and I will gain the mind of Christ. How can I know the mind of God unless Christ is growing within me? That is why He has given us His Spirit. And so, the Bible tells me that if I will trust in the Lord with all my heart, He is going to direct my paths. And He will help me correct bad mistakes I've made. Maybe it's in a relationship at home. Or maybe it's some other problem in your life. If I will acknowledge God and say, God, I'm not ashamed of you. I want, I want everyone to know my relationship with you. I'm not going to hide you. I want people at work. I want people in my family. I want my spouse. I want everyone, even my neighbors, to know I'm not ashamed of you. I need you desperately, and I'm acknowledging you. I'm putting you first. It's a matter of priorities. It is to say to God, I want you to be first in my life. And because you're first in my life, everything else must come into the order of God. I want you to be the king of my life, the king of my soul. And likewise, I want your word, it, it should be a light to my path, a lamp unto my feet, so that when I am going out into life, I don't want to live it my way. The Bible says there is a way to a foolish person. It's a way that they try to design apart from God. Maybe they're seeking money and that's all they think about or some position. They want to be a president of some company or they want to gain fame and wealth. Those are the, those are the snares of this world. They always have been. And because of that, many people neglect to have a relationship with God because they set God's purpose for their life. They set it aside. To them, God is dead. And they're living life independently of the Lord. And so they set out and they say, oh, there's the path I want to walk on. The Bible says there is a path to those kinds of foolish people that leads to destruction. They destroy themselves. They find there's no happiness on this path. There's no true peace. And that they not only hurt themselves, but all those people that could benefit if they were only following Jesus with their life, they're not there to do it. They're out seeking to please themselves. They're making a foolish attempt of gaining happiness. But there's no happiness apart from knowing God. He alone can fill that big, that big emptiness in my soul. And the only way that I can truly be happy, the only way you can be happy in life, is to set God first in your life, to trust Him, to love Him above everything else, and to say, Lord, I want to seek with everything in me, I want to seek the way, the path You've given me to walk, whatever it is. I want to know it, I want to live it, and I want to follow You with my life. What happens is this. God promises to give you peace. He promises to give you joy that no one else can take away. And He promises that your family, those you love, they are going to greatly benefit from the walk you're walking. Now, it may not be through your monetary, or it may be. It may be the possessions God gives you. I think God knows who can receive and can certainly handle money and power. 
of this world because it's the same person. They're rich no matter what because they're following Jesus. It's those kinds of people that can't handle money because you can give it to them or you can take it away and in their heart they're still rich because they have a relationship with God and their happiness and joy comes from following Him. I've known people in my life, I don't know exactly how much money and wealth they've gained, but it seems like the more they get, the more they give away and they're very happy people. They're always giving and, and uh, distributing to those who need, it seems to me. And I think that's why sometimes God allows those people to receive such things. To whom much has been given, much is required. But nevertheless, the point is this. If I'm following Jesus with my life, and in the presence of God, He will show me the path that He wants me to take in life. And if I will say to Him daily, Lord... I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be the one who gives me direction. I want to follow your promises. I want to know you more every day. And when I get up in the morning, I want, to, I want you to be the one who leads me out the door, where I work, where I go to school, if I get married, if I have children, everything, all the above. I want my life to be in your hands. I surrender all. And to you I give my life because you're worthy and because you're all-knowing. You have all wisdom and all power. And so I'm going to trust in you with my life because you're going to lead me to green pastures. And in doing so, all those people that I love, all my neighbors and the people that are around me in life, they're going to benefit because of the walk that I'm walking. You see, when I'm walking with God, His presence is with me. And when His presence is with me, it's not only uh, bringing great riches to my life, riches of the soul, but it's also going to bring great riches to my family. I've known some people in my life that brought great riches to my family. Both of my grandmothers, they brought great riches to me. I don't know if I ever got more than $10 from them from a money, but the example that they lived the integrity and the kindness and the compassion that they showed. They brought families together. They helped us love one another as family. Cousins love cousins even today because certain people as our grandmother and also even on another side of my family, my grandmother, I never got to know her as much as the other because she lived down in Richmond, Kentucky. But nevertheless, when I would be in her presence, I felt a great love she had for me and a love and respect she had for God. And I don't forget that. And I benefit from that. I benefit more from that than anything else she could have ever given me or anybody else like my mom and dad and my brother and all of my family and those at my church that I've grew up with. So many people have contributed to my walk in life and it's not because of the money they gave me or, the, or any kind of possessions. It's because of the example and because of the love and the truth that they shared with me so that I would keep walking the walk of faith. And now here I am tonight and I would rather not be anywhere else in the world than sharing God's Word with you right now. And I promise you that. This to me is the greatest privilege of all. And I count on God to make a way for me as a father. A way to help my children. You know, recently we just celebrated Father's Day and I got cards from my three kids. I've always told them you could have gotten always a better dad than me. And I say that humbly and I mean it. I truly mean that. I don't deserve those three kids. I've heard them sometimes and I wish I could do things differently, but they all gave me cards and each one of them said something very similar. And I'm not saying this to brag at all. I'm not. I'm so very thankful. They all said this in one way or another. Dad, thank you for sharing Jesus with me. It made the difference. All the mistakes I've made, I'm glad I took time to share Jesus. Or God allowed me to be in their life to share Jesus with them. And now they have a path to follow. And I hope that God will make a way for them that they would love each other as my family has on earth. And, and as they get older, they'll be friends with each other. And God will make a way. But the point is, the message here to this evening is a lesson from the cross. When Jesus went to the cross and He died, He made a way when there was no way. 
You and I could never know God as our Father. Our sins could never be forgiven. We would be eternally separated from God if it was not for the way that God made to us through Jesus Christ. He did the impossible. That's why Jesus said, with men this is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. God's way makes the impossible possible. So that I can, I can develop relationship with other people. I can do things that I never thought I could do. It's because God makes a way. But it's always by God's power, by God's wisdom, by God's grace. Are you following God's way in your life? I hope I'll end my race. That is the walk He's given me. I hope I end it. Living an example for those around me. Yes, my children. And more than that, their children. And those friends and people I work with. I hope they might remember the last part of my life. More than the mistakes I've made before. God has a way. A way for you and I. That's the important message I want you to hear. God wants you to hear. Whoever you are, He wants you to know He has a way for your life. And that way is following Jesus. Set aside everything else and go after Him. And He will bless your life. He'll change your life. And He'll make your life a blessing to all of your family. God can do that. And He will do that. If you've never received Jesus tonight or whatever time it is, wherever you are, why not open up your heart? The Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, confess He is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved means I am to say in my heart tonight, wherever you are, Lord Jesus, I invite you to come into my life. I want to travel the way. I want to follow you. And I invite you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I confess you are Lord. You died on the cross. You was raised from the dead. And I confess that you are the Lord and Savior. And I invite you to come into my heart and forgive me of my sins. If you'll pray that and sincerely communicate and pray that to God, He'll hear you wherever you are. And He will open up a new way. A way that God wants you, a purpose God has just for you. A purpose that He wants you to follow. And if you'll follow that and say, God, I don't know what it is or where it is, but I want to start following you with my life. And God will certainly bless your life. He promises He will. I want to close with a song. That speaks of this. Uh, it comes from Psalm chapter 30, 139. Psalm 139 talks about, Lord, search my heart. And if you see any wicked way within me, then remove it. Here's how it goes. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, Know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. Lord bless you till our next time. We actually hope to have our first face-to-face -face church service July 5th. But we'll continue these evening services on Saturday. 
And I look forward to maybe someday seeing you in this church building. If not, I look forward to joining you again by video. God bless you. It's been good to be with you and the Lord.